an absolute pleasure to have film director and owner of Scampy Jones Media, Rob Sloman, with me now. Um, he's directed and produced many different sports documentaries over the years, including those on rugby and golf, and most recently come to light with the fantastic football documentary, Everton, Howard's Way, uh, which came out last year. So, Rob, how are you, how are you doing, Pat? No, I'm all right. I'm all right, Max. How are you? Very good. Um, as I say, it, it's great to have you on, and it's great to actually finally have this chance to, to sit down and talk with you, you know what I mean? It'd be much preferred to, to do it over a cup of tea, but in the current situation, you know, just <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Um, We're all getting used to these, aren't we now? Yeah, it's, it's sort of the way of the world. I was going to say, um, I first saw you at the, at the premiere for, for Howard's Way, which were, was in, in two locations, firstly at Goodison and then at St. George's Hall. And unfortunately, didn't get the chance to speak to you at the, uh, at the sort of media part because it was really busy. You know, it was split between two different locations and everything was a bit chaotic. I didn't actually get the, the chance to speak to you um, until I believe it was the 2-0 home defeat against bottom of the league, Norwich, which I thought was... Yeah, I remember quite, it well. Yeah. I remember it well. Yeah. I mean, you've made this fantastic documentary on us at a, in our finest hour and typical of, uh, of these times that we spoke after that. And it, it wasn't until then, really, that I realised just... How much that you'd done because like you know we sort of spoke in depth and you said that you worked at sky sports and you'd studied journalism um and you'd work within say newspapers uh, and then switch to tv which is something that i'd like to ask you about later mm. firstly um especially for people around my age people like myself who are soon to graduate and um, want to find work in in the industry would you mind giving a sort of walkthrough of your career and how you've got to this point today Crikey. Um, well, it's a long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, at, at school, I, I always wanted to be um, involved with sports in, in any way, really. Um, I realised very early on, uh, I remember when I was about six or seven, people said, oh, are you going to be a footballer? I was, yeah, I'm going to be a footballer. And I, and I was very one-footed. I was quite quick, but I had nothing else. <laughs> so um, really and truthfully, um, probably rugby was my best game but I wasn't brave enough. <laughs> um, and um, so as I went through school, I realized I wasn't going to play anything. Um, and um, then I, I just started to look at, at what I could do that would keep me involved with, with sport. And um, I was down in Cornwall, a place called Bude. Um, I, I do remember a couple of teachers taking an interest in the fact that I thought maybe I could write about sport um, when I left school. And so um, helped me dig out um, some potential routes, uh, some courses, and we established that uh, do the A-levels and um, I could then do a, a one-year journalism course, NCTJ journalism course. I think there were about four or five different colleges um, that you could do those courses, where you could do those courses, and Cardiff was the one that, um, that I, I elected to try and go there. Um, so that would have been 1987. Uh, got uh, scraped through my A-levels with uh, good enough results to go there and I did scrape them um, and I went there and did this one year course and it was um, yeah a really a really enjoyable time um, um, I never really wanted to get three or four years of, of additional education that didn't really suit me I wanted to try and do stuff I'd done a little bit of work experience which is what they recommended when you got onto the course go and do some work experience if you can before um, before you start so I'd done work experience with a local newspaper just to get an idea of, of, of what people did I don't think that anybody anybody who's worked in local newspapers will tell you that you can really know what you're in for until you're part of a local newspaper but anyway when I did uh, a year's course there um, got the, the relevant qualifications so you pass the course. I can't remember what it's called a proficiency certificate a bit like riding a bike um, and so past that um, lots of things lots of things like shorthand which I still use now I still leave notes for people in shorthand forget all about it and of course they pick them up and they're like what 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 on earth does he want so um, yeah so learned that there and I was lucky because I came out I came out of college in uh, 88 and if I'd have done, uh, if I'd have taken the route that a lot of my friends did and did a three-year journalism course, they came out 1990. There were there were very few jobs, um, and and I when I came out in '88, um, I was able to cherry pick to a certain degree and uh, never considered that I wouldn't move away from Cornwall, fabulous place, but probably better to 
to now for me certainly as a as an adult to go down there on holiday with the kids etc rather than be there i felt um so i uh, got offered a couple of different positions took one on a on a paper called the surrey herald um in 1988 and joined there as a um editorial assistant or so i can't remember what the but um yeah, joined there um, in 88 and, uh, and went from there, really. Lots of cups of teas made for the first six months, I remember. <laughs> um, and, and initially, I was a bit concerned how I was going to get into sports there. There was a sports desk, but there were two people on it, and, um, and, I, and I wondered how that would work. But actually, it was very good to do the news training. Um, all of, all of the, uh, the early things that I did would follow a news reporter around go to to stories breaking and then you try and get a byline in the newspapers and then you want to get the front page byline and and so on and eventually people move around or or take a different job uh, either at that newspaper or move to a different newspaper or radio or tv or whatever uh, and a job came up on the sports desk um, and then i worried that i wouldn't be able to get into local sport that i was you know, too much uh, international and national sport and that it wouldn't interest me and I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, uh, from the moment I got on the sports desk of the Surrey Herald, which was by April, May of 1990, I absolutely loved it. Loved it. The non-league football that we used to do, I think back then it was called the Deodora League, um, uh, the conference and then the Deodora. And I, I had a blast of the time. I, I worked covering teams like uh, Staines Town and uh, Chertsey and Egham Town. I'll never forget Egham Town. They went on a, whilst I was there, they went on a run to the fourth qualifying round of the FA Cup, which is, which is a really big deal for a yeah. team that small. Um, and uh, they got beaten by Telford 2-0. Um, and, uh, you know, around about that stage, Telford were, were not a bad non-league team. Um, and obviously Everton had played them in the Cup a few years before that. But... Um, yeah, it was it was really good fun. Lots of characters on local newspapers. I would recommend that route to anybody. And I know newspapers aren't now what they were then, but um, but in terms of um, a learning experience, it was uh, it was fantastic. And I went from the Surrey Herald, where which gave me the opportunity to also cut. I love golf. I've always loved golf. And um, uh, where I was in Surrey was a big golf area, and uh, Wentworth was just up the road. It fell within our our map, if you like, of, of Surrey. So we were able to go there and cover the world match play and the PGA that were always at Wentworth, uh, the PGA in May, and the match play then was in October, I think, and um, got to see Seve was my hero. I hadn't worked with him at that point, went on to work with him later, but I remember going to the match play in the PGA um, at Wentworth at, with an armband um, as a member of the media and, uh, yeah, just followed him around. I didn't write many stories, I just followed Seve. So... Um, but it was a great experience. Went from that paper to another one based in Slough. Um, and again, it, that, was, that was fantastic as well. Was, um, was on that one for a couple of years as a sports editor. Um, and uh, we had, uh, the first year I was there, Slough Town were challenging Wickham, who were under Martin O'Neill. Um, so Martin O'Neill's Wickham and Dave Kemp's Slough Town were um, vying for promotion from the conference to the Football League and Wickham were a lot better than anybody else um, but I do remember even that had uh, you know some exciting times and the second year I was there um, Slough Town were fighting relegation from uh, from the conference and they didn't survive and um, actually uh, the last day they had to go to Halifax uh, and win to have any chance of staying up and it was the same day that Everton were playing Wimbledon having to win to have any yeah. chance um, and I was acting as, so I'd gone up to, to Halifax and I was acting as reporter and photographer. They didn't want to send two of us up there. So I had a, they gave me a camera and said, um, you know, whatever happens, take some pictures. So at the end, I went onto the pitch and, um, and obviously I'm listening. I've got one earpiece in just listening on the Walkman or whatever. And um, it's 2-2 two -two when I go on the pitch because the Premier League's got a few minutes left, about 10 minutes left. Slough have just been relegated. They've lost 1-0. So all the Slough players that I've got to know over the last couple of years and, and know one or two of them quite well, they're all in bits on the floor. Um, and, and I'm there just about to start taking pictures when Graham Stewart's goal goes in. <laughs> and um, with all due respect to Slough Town, they never really meant as much to me as Everton. So I'm now wanting to explode with joy, but at the same time, 
try and take pictures of of the Slough Town players who are desolate. They're on the floor, and and I'm uh, clearly not as desolate as they are uh, when I probably should be as the local reporter. Um, so that was an interesting few minutes while they were trying to work out why, you know, I didn't seem overly disappointed. And, and obviously, all I want to do really is get half a dozen shots taken, go and yell, and then possibly I think Les Briley was the manager of um, uh, of Slough when they went down. I think he was. Um, and I would just go and do the interviews, etc., and then go and see my mates who I'd driven up with, who were Slough Town fans, but all had a league club as their favourite, who would have been, you know, excited for me, I think, uh, and drive all the way back down from Halifax, you know, celebrating on the way that we were still a Premier League club. Yeah. Um, so that was, that, was, that was newspapers. And then uh, the following, uh, when was that? So that was 93 4, wasn't it? A couple of months later, I, I leapt. Uh, to go to, I was doing some national t- newspaper sub editing anyway, and I leapt because Sky were going from one channel to three, um, and so I wanted to to see what that was like. So I went across to Sky at that point. Okay, that that this is something that I really wanted to ask you about because similarly to, similarly to yourself, I was often told that I, I did media at, at A levels and, and what have you, and I was only, always told I had a specific talent for writing, but now. As you were saying, newspapers then to what newspapers are now are a very different animal. Um, mm. And I, hopefully a couple of years down the line, I really do want to make my own media company. But I'd imagine now, given the current climate, that the focus will be on video and audio. So I just wanted to ask what deferred you from writing to go into television? Um, I'm trying to think back. I just think that um, I, I still love writing. I still, uh, um, you know, I think everybody feels they've got a book in them, don't they? And I, yeah. I think that um, um, maybe actually the, 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 a book around the film um, that we've just made the Howard's Way m- might work because obviously I've got hours and hours of stuff from the players, but there are so many stories that, that, that came up that we weren't able to put in an hour and 50 minutes. Um, lots of other things that came up and, and many of which are fan related very funny stories, um, unbelievable stories to a kid like me from, from Cornwall who, who sort of you know, lived, um, lived a fairly sort of narrow and straight l- lifestyle down there and didn't break rules. Breaking rules is a big thing at the moment, isn't it? Well, I didn't break very many. Um, so, um, but I, I, so I, still, I still feel like I, I want to write and I'm quite happy to write. But Sky and TV, I think probably because I was reporting at that time, I fancied the idea of reporting on TV. But I remember one of the very first interviews that, that I had um, at, at Sky, um, a chap turned around to me and said, you know, there is, um, uh, there is power and glory in, in any form uh, of work. And, you know, with TV... Glory is potentially the people that, that are in front of camera and, and glory is only ever temporary. Um, and he said, you know, aim for power, <laughs> aim for power, be making stuff, be making decisions um, uh, and give yourself an opportunity of, a, of a potentially a longer career, maybe. And, and I also remember seeing, I think Jeff Stelling was one of, the, one of the first shows I worked on. Jeff Stelling was the presenter and I watched him and I thought, if you don't think you can ever be as good as that, then why would you bother? Because if, if you can't be really good at something, why would you do it? And I, and I watched him and I knew straight away, you know, you might have a good day where you think, yeah, you know, you know everything's flowing and I can certainly talk. <laughs> but um, I thought listening to him and the information he was being given and how none of the panic behind the scenes was translating to, to what you would see with Jeff, I thought that was a skill. Um, a great skill and I still watch him and, and know what's going on and, and, and think that he's somebody he came out of radio I think and probably started in newspapers I, I don't know about Jeff, but probably went newspapers radio tv um, and you get a great editorial background um, uh, coming through newspapers um, and I remember watching him and thinking that nah, nah, the, the guy I'd spoken to at, at Sky was right you know let's let's focus on because you can still write when you're you know, behind the scenes, you're writing scripts. It's very different to write scripts for, for, for TV than it is to write a story for a newspaper. But you learn all these things. You pick up the skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and quickly ag- ag- agreed with him that, you know, listen, this might be the, the thing to do. And, um, and also, uh, I think that the first couple of years at Sky, 
so the, the first couple of years at Sky when I thought, well, maybe I could do some um, reporting as well. I was coinciding with losing hair and losing confidence. So maybe thinking hmm, maybe behind the camera and, and uh, making some decisions rather than being up there and worrying about how my hair looks would be uh, would be the, the better way to go so um, yeah I, I, sky it felt like it felt like sky was going to become something and, and obviously it did um, and and there was they were covering so much sport and it was um, you know all the sports that I was interested in and obviously the Premier League was exploding etc it just felt like it was an, it was going to be an exciting place to be and, 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 it, and it was so yeah I, I could easily have stayed in newspapers. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was it was good fun, you know, writing stuff, going. Um, I, I never really got to experience the the you know going to a football match on, late on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night and the deadline phoning in copy and, and these guys that could do that never really did that. Um, but always felt I could write. But it, it, at that particular time, the mid nineties, it, it felt it, that it was an exciting company to join Sky. Very very much smaller than it is now. You know, the whole of Sky Sports then was was pretty much in one office, one fairly big office, but one office. And now, you know, I haven't been to Sky for a year or two, but the last time I went there, it was a complete maze. I mean, buildings everywhere, and and it looks, you know, it's uh, it's a it's an extraordinary place. And I've worked at all of the, um, I worked at ITV and BBC and and, and Sky and, and other places, and uh, never been blown away as I was when I last went to Sky and saw what a development it it, it now is. Mm. Um, but yeah, it felt exciting to make that switch, and and um, and that was probably the biggest driver behind it. And opportunities, you know, big events, really big events that they were working on. Um, that that to, to have a crack at it and see what would see what would happen. Most definitely, and um, very wise words. Aim for power, not glory. I'll, uh, mm. I'll be sure to take stock of them. Uh, now, Scampy Jones Media, I believe, two thousand and eight. Mm. Where, what were the, the steps that you took to get your own media company up and running? I feel it's a very well, smart move. <laughs> it, yeah, okay. It, it might seem like a smart move now. At the time, it seemed like one of very few options. Um, I'd been working uh, for a company. So I went from, let me try and, I, if I work it out as I talk, then it will make more sense to me. So I went from Sky to, I went from Sky to the BBC. Quite a difficult jump uh, going from, what that organization to the BBC or the other way around, I would imagine, because Sky sort of pretty much threw you in at the deep end and, and said, learn. Um, and the BBC, I went there thinking, well, oh, okay, I've, I've been at Sky four or five years, done quite a lot of stuff there. And I felt I was capable of doing, you know, quite a bit. And I went to the BBC and, and felt it was by Sky standards, quite restrictive, you know, quite um, um, done by the book. <laughs> Um, and um, it was just very different. So from having been able to, to get on, get tapes out, go and sort yourself out um, uh, at Sky, at BBC, you know, sign this, do this, go and see this person. It was very different. So I'm not saying one is right and the other one's wrong, but it was very different. So actually, I wasn't at the Beeb very long before. There was a company starting up um, uh, called British Eurosport. So Eurosport was very well established, but British Eurosport was starting up. Um, and they had great secondary rights, you know, you name the event, and they weren't the main rights holder, but they had secondary rights, so they weren't exclusive, but they were piggybacking, so the Olympics and the World Cup and, and the Rugby World Cup, which we worked on, and uh, European football, which I remember working on in, in 2000, first place I met Trevor Stephen was the Euros, 2000 Euros, which we had loads of technical problems, because we were some of us were back at base camp putting the programs together and other elements of the production were on site and we had i think the first game belgium were at home in the first game i think and um or belgium were playing in the first game and we had a five second delay between pictures and audio um and so we just couldn't they, the technical guys couldn't straighten it they couldn't sort it out so the commentator is so far ahead of the pictures that we're seeing um, and amongst some of the helpful suggestions we're getting is, can you not tell him to sort of delay his commentary, i.e. remember what he saw two seconds ago? <laughs> so just some unbelievable stuff. So I remember Mpenza scored the first goal and he shouts for, you know, Mpenza! And Mpenza is, is, hasn't got the ball in, in what the pictures that we're putting out. So we had loads of problems there, but Eurosport, it was, British Eurosport was great fun because all of the problems that it threw at us were things that you could never imagine coming. We'd gone virtual before anyone else had gone virtual. So no cameraman, 
just a, uh, there was a uh, studio director, the producer, me, who was also doing auto cue and graphics a lot of the time. So you're doing auto cue graphics. You're also operating this, the server to give clips. You know, when, so when you're doing analysis, that's coming from you as well. So there's three or four of you in this room instead of 10 or 12. And it was utter chaos at times, utter, utter, utter chaos. But, you know, you'd get home and you'd be exhausted, but you think, oh, it's brilliant fun. That's brilliant fun. So that was much as, you know, it was, it felt in many ways to go Sky, BBC, British Eurosport, maybe wasn't, you know, in terms of ego wasn't a great move. It was a brilliant move. So I spent a couple of years there um, and then did, uh, and then did the Lions, the British and Irish Lions behind the scenes in 2001. Eurosport, British Eurosport were part owned by NTL. NTL was sponsoring the Lions. So um, I pushed myself forward very hard to do that. Loved rugby, still do, and uh, got that gig. And that was the first documentary I'd ever been involved in and was in charge of it, um, which was quite frightening. Um, and that experience there basically was the template for everything else. Because what I saw, what I went through out there, and it was, it was, it was quite hard, you know, the six or seven weeks thrown in with these world-class athletes who don't know who the hell you are, and don't have much time for you, certainly don't have any respect for you to start with. Um, and uh, that, was, that was eventful. So we did six weeks, seven weeks with them, and then you come back and you edit it for uh, about the same, about eight weeks it was. Um, but that, that experience, I knew at that time, that moment there, okay, that's what I want to do. I don't know if I can do it, because it's one thing to say, yeah, I want to go and cover major events, and make documentaries. It's another thing to be able to find people who will back you or, or, or help you. Mm -hmm. But I knew from that moment that's what I wanted to do if I, if I could. So, um, so I went uh, from Eurosport, funnily enough, I went to ITV um, and um, ITV Sport Channel, the 20th, uh, or I can't remember what it was called, but the Sports Channel, ITV Sport, maybe it was called Sports Channel, fell over within six months of being there. And I was lucky because the people that had uh, been involved on, with the DVD and the video of the Lions Tour owned a company that they were looking to make uh, a, a lot bigger. They wanted a TV arm, they wanted a sports production arm. So that was, that was a really big break. And I went to them, and so I didn't, I wasn't out of work for any point. And lots of people went to the ITV channel, um, sport channel, and you know, trusted that, that that would go on for a few years. And of course it didn't, mm -hmm. um, but I was lucky. And I, and I got this company called Lace, um and if you've got dvds like england five germany one that's you'll look at the publisher for those and it's and it's lace so we went down there and i started working for lace uh in 2002 and um timing was good they had the rights for the rugby world cup for the following year um and uh england won the world cup and i went i went out there and um was able to make a film about that tournament and, and again, it was sort of interviewed. It's a bit quite similar to to a Howard's Way, really, in that that um, when and spoke to a lot of the players afterwards and put the film together retrospectively. Um, but was there from 2002 until 2008 when the company 2008, if you remember, the early part of that year financially was a disaster. Yeah. For everyone. And um, they were about to to expand. And in fact, when they went to expand, the banks told them, "No, actually, you're going to have to cut back." So uh, Lace TV was a victim of, uh, of that. Um, and so had a couple of weeks where I wasn't sure what I was going to do and took loads of advice. And then, okay, with the contacts that I've got um, and the people I've worked with, maybe this is worth having a crack at. Um, uh, but didn't really know whether it was going to work out or, or not, Max, to be honest. Um, if, if you told me, what are we now, 2020, so 12 years on, yeah. that it would it would have gone as well. Certainly it didn't feel like it was going to go that way. I think early part of 2009 and you're just thinking, I don't know what to do here. Um, but stuck with it, kept, you know, just when you think this might be a problem, another contract would come in, somebody else, another phone call, whatever, um, and, and just managed to, to just about keep it going. So um, it was, it was certainly more luck than, than judgment. I didn't intend, I wasn't in March, uh oh wait i wasn't thinking oh i must set up a production company of my own and, and in may oh wait i had one so that's that's how it worked brilliant and i'm i'm very glad that it's been successful you know mm. for, for the likes of howard's way um it's most definitely for me now it's good never mind sports film but it's up there with 
my favourite films just full stop. Like, it's one of those films that I can watch continually. Like, I've watched it multiple times already. Do you know, as soon as I got, even before, uh, when I was at the previous company, Lace, I was writing treatments for an Everton film because I just thought, well, nothing's been done. And, you know, uh, if someone will, will show enough interest and I'm working for a company that's got roots to the, you know, the big uh, film houses, the universals, etc., of this world. But no one at that point really believed in it. Um, and so you just sort of tuck it away and you think, well, maybe I'll be able to bring out that treatment. I think very, around about that time, around about maybe 2007 was the first time I'd written something called um, Everton, the team that time forgot. Um, but uh, yeah, it took a, <laughs> took a lot longer to, to get it going. But, um, you know, I, I was lucky with Lace that, that um, that's how the Sevi thing happened. Just an email from his company at that time before he was poorly um, found its way to me. And, you know, you then get, you end up then spending a year at that point. Uh, so that would have been 2006. And the following year, we make uh, a documentary with Sevi, who was, you know, Bob Latchford, Viv Richards and Sevi Ballesteros were my three heroes they were my three heroes all that time uh, as a kid growing up and um had plenty of others that weren't quite on that level you know mm -hmm. i was a big kirk stevens fan won't mean anything to you but kirk stevens jimmy connors i love jimmy connors and um and uh, every, you name a sport and i had somebody that i liked but those three stood alone latch latchford and uh, uh viv richard and, and, and sevi so got unbelievably spent a year working with sevi you know went to augusta with him and and we took a helicopter out before people used drones. We took a helicopter over St. Andrews and filmed with Sevi. I mean, mind blowing stuff really. I, I think about it now and, and the, the good fortune for those things to, to end up uh, with me. And then, you know, when it was, um, when it was Scampy Jones, um, yeah, the, the bigger film ideas that, that you had were more difficult to push through because who are you? You know, you might've worked at Sky and Beeb a few years back, but doesn't the really mean much now. So you, you've got to make a film to be able to make films almost. And, um, you know, it, it was a long time making good contacts that um, eventually you you stumble on one. And, and Everton, I was lucky, I went to Universal about something completely different. Um, and the guy there at the time was, you know, he'd, he'd, been, he'd been behind, I believe, in Miracles from Universal's point of view. So, you know, he was looking for another, I believe, in Miracles. Mm -hmm. And he, he said to me, you know, I think a film about your mob in the 80s would, would work. It has, it has so many um, similar uh, aspects to it. And I, I was like, well, so happens <laughs> that, that, I, that I have something. So he said, well, go away and flesh it out and, and, um, and send it to me and get yourself a budget and, um, and we'll have a look at it. And, and I did those things. Um, and he, um, he loved it um, and then left Universal. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it felt like starting again and, and that's why in the end we didn't go with Universal because their appetite uh, for the particular film went with Richard I, I felt and then it was all about trying to a you know, story I've told a few times about trying to get um, private investment um, and um, you know that's that's not easy so that, you know, but it, it all started with a with a trip to Universal and, uh, and, a, and a chap called Richard Thompson Interesting. Now, you mentioned I Believe in Miracles to me when we met after that Norwich game and cited it as a, as a big... Yeah, I said go and watch it. Didn't I? Yeah, yeah I've, I've watched it recently. Um, maybe my personal bias, but I do much prefer Howard's <laughs> Way. Um, for, for those that don't know, it, I Believe in Miracles stories by Brian Clough joining them, Nottingham Forest, uh, leading them to promotion and two European Cups. Very much a story that deserves to be told. But... Um, as, as, as an Everton fan, what I've always loved, and I suppose as a media student as well, I've loved the fact that there's always been a sort of, there's always been a relationship there with the club and the media almost. You know, you had, in the 60s, you had gold, the Golden Vision, which um, tells the story of the, the team in the 60s and that FA Cup triumph. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then you've got the likes of the Here, in the Here We Go records from, from the 80s themselves. Um, mm -hmm. What I, what I wanted to ask is um, what I think stands Howard Way out so much more in comparison is the, the, the way you include the context of the 60s and the 70s um, from when Howard arrives to get in the perspective of, of so many different people, from like players, fans, Derek Hatton's in there, 
uh, Keith Mullen from the farm and you get media personnel and their opinions like Clive Tilsley and, and Jim Rodenthal. What was the intention in mind when you started off on the process of making Howard's Way? What was the intention? Uh, yeah. ooh, it was to give the side some credit, I think. Yeah, I, um, I, we're all biased as, as Evertonians, but that team, I mean, that team has just never received the, the, the credit that it deserved. And, and we will never be able to prove that it would have gone on to create its own dynasty. Um, you can't prove it. I think it would have, in an era when I think, I think English clubs had won seven of the previous eight European Cups, not counting 85. Uh, so uh, if you don't count the, the night of highs, will Liverpool win that game if there's no trouble? I'm sure they were the best side uh, in Europe other than us. And um, uh, English sides dominated Europe. And I think there was, I think Everton were as good a side as England had had going into Europe for a long time. You know, it's difficult to say anything against uh, the Liverpool team or, or, or Forest. But, I, you know, the Forest game against um, um, Hamburg, I remember um, Hamburg, I could be wrong, but I remember Hamburg battering Forest. And, and certainly um, when Villa won, they beat Bayern Munich, didn't they? Bayern Munich, you know, they, it, was, it was all Bayern Munich and Villa scored the goal and, and hung on to it, you know. So, you know, great, they were resolute, but Everton were a lot more than that. Everton were a lot more than the Villa team. And, and I, it's difficult to compare eras, isn't it? But I, I, you know, to, to suddenly go past a Liverpool team by so many points, beat them three years that, that season, didn't concede a goal, you know, Everton were better than Liverpool. Mm. And the injury that I, the, the one thing that I think that I, I always, it would have been nice to be able to tell it in the film, but obviously it happened afterwards. Bracewell's injury against Newcastle in 86. Okay, so he plays a lot of games after that. But, you know, I'm sure if you ever do anything with Paul Bracewell, he knows and everybody knows he was never the same after that. And if you look at the missing ingredient, which made Everton, you know, a really good side at the end of 83-4, winning the FA Cup, but then made them, by far the best team, 84-5. Well, what is there? There's two players. There's Bracewell and there's Van der Nauer. And Pat obviously made a difference. But that midfield was entirely dominant over every team that they played that season, mm. other than when they were knackered. Um, and, uh, you know, Reed and Bracewell and Stephen and Sheedy, a lot of people online putting their best teams um, of Everton through the eras together at the moment, isn't there? You know, pick your team from the 60s, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. 90s. And obviously, I never saw the Holy Trinity. So, you know, I can't, if you're picking teams that you watched, but I cannot put Kanchelskis above Trevor Stephen. I can't put anybody above Bracewell or, or, or Reed, and certainly not Sheedy. So, you know, it, it, it was a magnificent uh, team and a magnificent midfield with the best goalie in the world, the fastest back four that you can ever imagine. They were all sprinters. They were all real athletes. And then up front, tell me who'd want to play against Sharp and Gray. Or, mm. you know, you, you ask the players, um, you ask Kev Sheedy and, and Trevor Stephen how good Adrian Heath was. You know, they talk about him being their favourite striker of all. So, listen, you know, that was an incredible team. And... Uh, but for Brace's injury and then 87, them all wanting to, to, um, to disappear and play European football or manage European teams, I, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't have been um, winning a lot more uh, towards the end of that decade and the start of the next. And then, you, then Sky arrives in 92. You can't, I just won't have it that if none of those things, if, if we're still playing Euro, European football in 87 when Everton would go in as champions of, of England, if we're still playing European football, I don't, I just don't have it. A young team, 24 average in 86, um, are not, Everton are still not a giant club when Sky arrives with the money in, in 92. I, I, you know, I, I think that, that Heisel had a terrible, terrible damning effect. Obviously, mm. listen, other clubs have, have recovered from not being in Europe at that time, done better. I'm not saying that we did everything right. Obviously, there were things that we did very wrong in that period of time. But, the decline started in, in eight at Heisel um, and, and we've never recovered from it, in my opinion. Most definitely. And that, that's, that's, my, that's the point that I try to make, especially towards Liverpoolians who seem to be quite stubborn to the idea that, you know, as you say, yes, we didn't do everything right. But if we are in those positions of winning league titles and winning European honours, when the Premier League monies kicks in around 92, I've got no doubt that we'd be sort of asserting our dominance and still competing quite heavily for those, you know, those European places yeah, now. I agree with you. It's all about timing, isn't it? It's all about timing. I've said it a million times, but, you know, if, if Heisel happens in the mid-70s, then Liverpool don't get their chance to, to, 
to create that dynasty. There is no Liverpool dynasty. Those players don't become the, the extraordinarily famous names that they are now. You know, I, I was watching Harry's Heroes last week and Trevor Stephen was in an episode. Trevor Stephen was in an episode, one of the best players ever to play for Everton, but potentially got a, a lower profile than a lot of the others in that film who achieved nothing like he did in the game. Mm. Nothing like it. You know, he more England caps, um, two league titles, European title, you know, FA Cup. So all of those achievements, but, but you would have done well to spot him in, in Harry's Heroes. Now, if Everton had had the opportunity to go on and play in European Cups and win European Cups, are you telling me that Trevor Stevens' profile would be so, so low that he doesn't merit a mention in Harry's Heroes mm. with those other guys. And I know that there might be stronger stories there because somebody's, you know, so overweight or the gambling and the debt. Those are all good stories, and I, I get it editorially. Um, but there are other players on that pitch that didn't achieve what he did that were featured um, uh, in, a, in a more um, positive fashion, you know. And, and he, he was in one of those. Actually, one of the reasons why he didn't get uh, more of a part, I, I believe, is because he honoured a, a Howard's Way engagement for me. Um, but um, but you know it's it's ridiculous that, that team that that those those quality of players at that age, um, Bracewell, so and young, Scott, it's ridiculous yeah, how young that's. It was only Reedy and Andy Gray that were, and they weren't thirty. I think Andy might have been thirty by the time he left, or just about to be. But you know, really young, really young team, mm -hmm. and all of their profiles would have skyrocketed. Um, and that would have that would have uh, helped them with their careers after football as well. You know, they would yeah. be a lot more Evertonians in in galleries. You know, now in on Match of the Day and Sky, etc. There, there just would be, because they would have achieved more. They would have done more. They'd have had more media columns. All of these things which helped towards you know back then when they weren't you know given hundred thousand pound salaries per week. You know, the, these guys missed out on so much. Um, and who knows where they would have gone and, and mm. what they would have achieved. So, yeah, there were a lot of reasons for, for, for feeling sad about um, uh, uh, the fact that Everton were denied the opportunity. But, you know, it meant more, it, it, it probably had more impact. I think it had more impact on, on Everton players, fans, clubs profile than any other club because of where they were set to go. Mm. You know, Heisel in 94, 95, Manchester United don't get there opportunity the best players in Europe aren't going to come to a club that's not in Europe because by then Europeans were coming to the Premier League yeah. weren't they so um so they don't get that opportunity and um it's it, it feels like that's the reason that's one of the reasons why um people level that we, we live in the past etc because it was an opportunity that very few um have been denied that that team being so young so good and then just sort of cut off in the in their prime that that's that's why i think so many of us um heave a heavy sigh when um other people don't seem to to understand or, or, or get why we're so annoyed yeah you're telling me i was born 98 i didn't even get to experience it but i, I still share the same views and that's a that's a fantastic point that if the you know imagine if those players would have got that was celebrated in that sort of celebrity status that the players get today you know the social media era almost i suppose it just provide us with so much more exposure but just wanted to talk about the sort of editorial process of Howard Way obviously you know you had a strong background there um, and I thought it was and it, again it's something that really set the film apart for me was just how creative you were in that sort of pushing the film along you know through the use of like um, sports news programs teletext yeah. um, I know yeah. you, you use Sabutio to, for the buying game as well like it was so creative so I'm just wondering how the uh, the editorial process was for you? Well, you know, it's your youth, isn't it? You, it's the things that I remember from that era. So, you know, the day that, um, that Adrian Heath got uh, clobbered by Brian Marwood, I was on, um, so our school was on a trip to London. Um, and my only means of finding out how Everton were doing against Sheffield Wednesday that day was to find uh, a TV that had teletext or, or CFAT. Um, and I remember thinking, well, two birds with one stone here. I always wanted to go in Harrods. So I went marching into Harrods no, for no other reason than to find the TV section and then just planted myself there and, and, and watched, um, found a TV that had the, the football scores coming up and the pages changing. And um, obviously it didn't tell me that, uh, that Heath, had got, uh, Heath had got injured, but it, it did say that we were 1-0 down. Mm -hmm. And I stuck it out. Uh, in the store until it was one all and then I think we had to go or, or something so that was my only way of finding out what the what the scores were CFAX half the time 
you know, and we didn't have at home, I, we didn't have a CFAX telly, we didn't have a telly with Teletext. So, so I remember we had some friends and my mum would say, oh, we're going to go around to such and such is today. And I'd be chuffed to bits because I had no interest in talking to their friends, but I had a big interest in putting CFAX on and, and just surfing the sports pages. What was it, 302? On the, see, again, you're, you're a youngster, but I'm pretty sure that um, football was 302. So the main sport was 301, football was 302, and then that was your headlines. And I loved it. I loved CFAX. That was my youth. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there was a bit of radio that I used in there uh, from Sport on 2 back in the 80s, that uh, theme music that was such a part of my time. And um, it was all the things that I found um, interesting back then and, and I could relate to because I couldn't relate to how tough it was for people in Liverpool the reason for straight away going to get someone like Dave Feely was that that he lived that he went home and away for you know from the 70s onwards um and his understanding of you know being an uh, an Evertonian and you know, his story is extraordinary anyway but but um just his knowledge of what it was like growing up in in Liverpool at that time particularly as an Everton fan who didn't have anything to cheer mm. you know you got the ones across the road he gave me an analogy I've always remembered it. And he said that, that uh, you know, effectively Everton were living in those sort of old Victorian buildings with um, 10 to a room and, you know, no facilities. And, and that was their life. And then across the road, there were the big Georgian mansions where, where Liverpool fans were and, you know, in their swimming pools and smoking the big cigars, etc. And then he said, and one day we just, we just went across the road and we kicked the door down. To their big mansion and we we dived in their swimming pool and we took their champagne and we smoked their cigars um and then he said and then we got kicked out you know but 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 that that analogy of of how we suddenly you know came to life and, and took everything that was theirs for an all too short period of time I, I really like that um and he's a very clever guy and and i knew that he could give me um what i needed in terms of authenticity and then he said, you need to speak to Keith because Keith and, and, and Dave Feely are, are big friends, but very big mates. And, and he said, Keith will help you with the music. And he did more than help because, you know, I had ideas in my head. Some, you know, I, I've read Dave Feely in particular and other people say, oh, you know, um, I had no idea about the music. Well, you know, I, there was some like rip it up. I'd already got an, uh, an embarrassment by madness. But, but the ones that I really needed were the ones that meant a lot to, to the people of, of, of Liverpool. So the mm -hmm. Lotus Eaters and, and to know more about the, the bands. And, and we had the, the for a, a period of time. Um, uh, and um, this is the day, which is a great song. And I would never have got that. And I know we lost it in the end, but it was things like that. These little nuggets that Keith was giving me uh, and, and saying, don't worry about that. Here's another one and another one. And, and he was it just this, this list of, uh, of bands that were either, big in Liverpool, came from Liverpool or played a lot in Liverpool, like Fiction Factory, I think we're a Scottish band, but, but you know, we're often playing the Liverpool music scene. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, as soon as I would listen to 10 seconds of these songs, I thought it just transported me back to my, my era that where I'd heard these songs, you know, 30 years ago, and maybe in some cases I've not heard them since, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so suddenly the music was, was, was authentic you know, the fans' experience were authentic. There's so many things that, that uh, ran that chat in the, in the pub that we did. There's a few other stories that came about there. Keith got a fantastic story uh, of getting into the Milk Cup final um, at Wembley, one without tickets and two in a stolen car that, that he didn't know was stolen. I, I mean, just, just brilliant stories that I can't relate to because I come from Cornwall and, and, and it wasn't like that for mm. me. So, you know, I, I knew what was relevant to me in terms of, you know, the voices like Jim Rosenthal and, and Clive Tilsley, and I, I've worked with both of them and know them well enough to be able to approach them and say, look, I, I'd, I'd love you to be on this and, and bring something to it. And they were both brilliant. Um, Clive brought along all the memorabilia. That, you know, he, I saw him load some up on Twitter yesterday. His, his match notes are brilliant, aren't they? Yeah, his, ma his match notes, his handwriting. His handwriting is lovely. <laughs> I, I think you have to have really nice handwriting to be able to cram all the information in um, that Clive has done on those. But I, I could listen to Clive and Jim talk about that era and their stories all day and there's and the film wasn't the vehicle just for them but there's so much stuff I've got of them and, and I'll probably put something up uh, um one of Jim's stories but 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 they lived it they were around these guys all the time so they know this stuff so why not make use of them because everyone knows who they are and then you get the lovely bits where you can use Clive's commentary or Jim's pieces to camera 
Um, I spoke to Elton Wellsby and Elton said he'd prefer not to do it. And so fair enough, um, because Elton was around them all of the time. Um, so it was, to me, it was important to try and make it feel um, of its time, you know, mm -hmm. so that if the music then drags you back, um, and, and yeah, I, I knew some of the tracks, but Keith did an unbelievable job on that. And then he composed the incidental music. There was another chap called Pete Davison who did some great stuff as well, but, um, but Keith did the majority of the, uh, uh, of the non-commercial tracks and the, and the stuff at the end, which I think there's two brilliant tracks there. I think one's called, if you look at it on um, Spotify or, or go to download, it's called Warm Heart, which is the tune that we picked for, um, for Harold's, uh, Harold's, Howard's funeral, which obviously had to be right had to be the right tune and, and Keith did an amazing job on that. Um, so yeah, get the music, get little things like CFAX, Sabutio, yeah, I played a lot of Sabutio when I was younger. Um, and then um, Thomas Regan, Tom Regan, who's Toffee Art on, um, on Twitter. Um, I, either he or the guy that had bought them put up those amazing figures um, from the European Cup Winners' Cup team and the detail on it, I just couldn't believe the detail. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to him and, and he said, listen, have a chat with, with Edward who's, who, who commissioned these. I spoke to Edward and Edward said, oh, I've got, actually got, a, I've built myself a little Goodison Park, um, <laughs> but not just Goodison Park 2019. It, it, it's, a, it's 1985. I've tried to recreate it as much as I can. So we went along to his place and I'd got this idea, I'll take them out of the packets and stuff. But then to see what he'd built, you know, oh, it's it brilliant. Well, it's one of my favourite shots in the whole film is is the line where where we pan along my cameraman um, Damien Bradshaw, who worked hugely long hours, um, and you know they don't get any more pay. A, a um, cameraman doesn't get more pay just because he does three jobs in a day. He gets the same. So I worked him really hard, and he was incredibly understanding. But but the shots that he got there that day, I loved them. I loved them, and it was I had to be careful not to use too many to just sort of become self-indulgent. Oh, I love that one as well. You know, I had it in my head that once I saw the picture, we can do some of the tackles here. And, you know, I even did the, the ball boy because he had a ball boy. Oh, and, the yeah, ball yeah. Boy. Oh, I really like that. It made me laugh. So, so included that. But, but those, those look great. And um, so you get those little bonuses as you go along that you don't know that you're going to get when you start the whole thing. And, um, and John from Retrotex, he phoned me when we'd already started putting the film together and I'd got my idea of how the graphics would look and I'd do it fairly similar to I Believe in Miracles, just do the chart and then get the name going up or down the chart, um, the, the, the table. Um, and, um, and John wrote to me and said, if, if you think I can help, I'd love to. And, and I thought his stuff was, was fabulous. So I, yeah, I, 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 got, I got back to him and I said, could you do this? Could you do that? And he's like, yeah, nothing was too much trouble. So I would hugely recommend Retrotext. I've got, I've got his mugs here. I've got the mugs in the room. He's sent me a couple of mugs, but you know, um, so Retrotext mugs, they're brilliant. brilliant. Um, any game, any occasion. So um, he did those and I suddenly took away all my anxiety where, with graphics, because I thought, okay, we now have a style and we'll find some, you know, you just go on these sites to find tellies, old fashioned tellies, put the text in those. So that helps. So you suddenly got Keith and Sabutio and, and the, the retro text, uh, CFAX looking stuff. Um, and, but in terms of using old films, always loved that. Loved that. And um, when we were working, when I was working on a film called Sevi, I was only the archive director on that one, archive producer, and I didn't really have a say in it. But I love using old titles because I think, again, it throws you back to the era. So um, when you've got you know, the LWT, dum, 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 da, 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 that thing going up. I loved that. That took me straight back to 70s, 80s. And, the, and I originally, in the first cut, had the big match tune from my era, you know, you won't remember that, but lots of people will. And I had that, but it was, it was where I also had a bit of music and I was going to dip out of the music to go to big match and then come back. And I got talked out of that. Um, it's one of those where I probably wish I'd stuck to my guns, but um, but all of those things are part of throwing you back to an era. Mm -hmm. And so I was very keen on using title sequences and Athe to deal with the stuff of old. Um, didn't go to town on Dixie, but certainly with Colin Harvey's, you know, the fact that I saw that he'd scored the goal in 66 and that was beautifully done and it allowed me then to introduce him. And I always wanted to use the 66 cup final. Um, and then when I got hold of Frank Wilmot, um, who was the windmill, 
from eight, from the Anfield game. I thought, okay, so I can now use that how I want to. I use Eddie Cavana running on the pitch oh, yes. in, in 66 and getting tackled uh, and hope that people realise when I do when I do it, that I just haven't stuck it in the middle of the film and that if you watch the next five or six minutes, it'll become apparent why he's there. And so once I knew I got Frank, that allowed me to use 66 and Eddie Cavana uh, and keep the, the Colin Harvey stuff um, to, to introduce Colin at, at mm-hmm. the start of the film. I love, I love, I love all the old stuff. I, I, I'm forever surfing it now to see if there's anything relevant to, to films that we may or may not be doing. And, um, and I just think they add, I think they add character and, and a sort of richness and and also that that the bit of a surprise you know the surprise element of you think you've got used to the to the way that the film the rhythm of the film and I like to sort of throw stuff in there not to put people out of their comfort zone but just to make people think you know and and that was a big big part of it you know plotting it um when you write down you know I think I had in a book I had about uh, you know each each scene was a number you know and it I got to about 200 and 280 scenes and you know I would I would underscore or I'd highlight pen where I was got the opportunity to go back in time um whether it was with Pathé or with something um from 20 years earlier or, or whatever it might be um so even when Andy Gray's talking about when you wear the number nine shirt um it gave me an opportunity to use Latchford and Dixie Dean and originally they were both sort of 10 second chunks there bit of Dixie Dean um, hanging on goalposts, which is from Pathé News, uh, and, and Latchford scoring a goal. I had him scoring one where he, a diving header and he runs away and did that double-fisted jump thing. And in the end, because I'm trying to cut down film and save on archive, those things went. Um, but, uh, yeah, really important, I think, to, to keep throwing people back to an era. I think they work really well as a vessel for, um, for you know, decorating the film was the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, I've never done, I've never want, yet done anything where I throw it forward beyond the film, you know, to go to a, another era. I mean, in, in theory, you could have maybe if you were working at how, how do you get 95 in there or, or something like that. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe that's another film. But um, yeah, I love, I love using um, title sequences and, and, and old footage to try and create a mood. Yeah. Brilliant. So, cause... I, I know we talked about the the last dance and that's all the, all the rave at the moment um, about the Chicago Bulls in the nineties and one of the sort of media criticisms I had I mean, watching it through the sort of media student lens is it, it is quite jumpy between mm. you know ninety four then it's ninety seven uh, it it can be a bit discombobulating but the way you sort of yeah. integrated um, that sixty six final and and all the sort of flashbacks I thought it was done really well and. Just finally to sort of talk about the era and then move on mm-hmm. to the, the interviews that you had with the players. Mm-hmm. What I, I, As you say, being from Cornwall, you deserve huge credit for the sort of how you encapsulated that era in and around Liverpool at the time because I found, obviously not experience in the 80s, I, I did find it really politically informative, um, mm-hmm. obviously with the inclusion of, of Derek Hatton in there as well. Um, how did you find it? Was it like a learning process for yourself as well, finding out all these things? Because like my dad's told me about the riots and and things like that, and all sorts of crazy stories. So, how about yourself? When I, when I first when I first put a, um, a treatment together, having gone to see uh, Universal and come back from that, the, the first thing I did was work the Toxteth riots into it because obviously eighty one Howard arrived Toxteth riots that summer. So so that was something I wanted to to get some information on. Um, fairly early on so I knew that what I was looking for um, you know I, actually the, the film wasn't it, it, the finished version wasn't as political as perhaps it might have been at one stage I, and I say political in the loosest sense it, it probably had less footage of, of news footage of, of, of Derek and, and, and the riots and, and Thatcher etc uh, than it might have had but, but Two Tribes came out um, earlier in the year and I thought it was a great film I really enjoyed it but I thought it did that, and I, I felt like, okay, I, I'll, I'm going to make this more Everton-centric now. Uh, actually, the criticism that I've seen of the film o- online, it's been, you know, the reviews have been largely uh, wonderfully warm and positive. And I've seen a few people say too much Derek Hatton, and I understand that he was very divisive, is now, was then. Um, so I understand that. We even had somebody storm out of the, we did a, um, we did one in um, London. We did mm-hmm. a show in London. Um, 
uh, premiere in London of the film and uh, somebody left um, very early on, um, fed up with too much Derek. Um, but I, I just read up on that era. I wanted to read up on it and find out, you know, what it was like. Um, and um, I had always planned to include Derek. At one point I'd uh, included um, uh, Michael Heseltine because he was sort of unofficial minister of Merseyside after, after Toxteth. Um, and I wondered if I could maybe get Hesseltine and, and, and Hatton together. Um, and Derek said yes, and, and um, Michael Hesseltine's office said uh, they are not. Um, so um, we didn't do that. Um, but listen, I come from, I, I lived on a farm in Cornwall. Um, and my dad was uh, a very blue um, and not Everton. Um, and you have to understand why people they're worried about their land farmers were worried about their land and um and you have to sort of you you understand what your your family politics are and why and you know i've never been overly political really but then i went away to college and it, it was let's say it was very different to to cornwall the politics there that, that i encountered there um and you know then you make your own mind up with the people that that you see and and what you understand is going on and down south I, again I, I didn't really have a proper understanding of what it was like you know now in Liverpool but but certainly then in the late 70s 80s and and again it was helpful to to speak to people about that and um, whether you agree with uh, Derek's politics or not I felt he was a very very important part of that story um, and the relationship that he had with the Tory government and the decisions that that um, that the Labour Council were preparing or, or, or looking to to the decisions they were looking to take and the impact they were going to have on on the people in the city. I wanted to know what that felt like, and and um, I don't think we come down on one side or the other really in in the film. Um, but you know, ninety percent youth unemployment for for areas in Liverpool. Um, you know, people didn't have very much up here. People certainly weren't coming out. To, so Keith and, and David, when they left school, they weren't getting jobs. Mm. You know, I spoke about earlier when I left college, I, I had a choice. You know, they didn't have a choice. Um, and it was important to try and convey some of that, you know, the, the mood. Uh, again, I don't think I did too much of it, really, because I didn't feel qualified to do too much of it. Mm. I felt like, you, you know, I didn't want to take myself out of my own comfort zone, even though I had the experience of, of David and Keith and Derek Hatton uh, and and anyone else uh, and, and you know a lot of the players felt felt what was going on they they you're isolated to, to a certain extent aren't you when you you know when you play for a football club and you know but Adrian said that uh, he once got turned away his car got turned away and I think the players a lot of the time had sponsored stuff on the outside of their car so people could see who it was driving uh, and he came across a roadblock somewhere and they were saying like look you need to turn around so the players knew what was going on. They knew it was difficult. They appreciated the sacrifices that fans were making to, to get down there. I thought it was nice to use. I was disappointed when I watched um, Two Tribes and they had some of the same footage that I'd planned to use from uh, a film called Howard's uh, Home and Away and a film uh, and some of the news footage that you, you've got and you think, mm, I, wish, I wish they'd not already used it. But, you know, it, it meant that that the politics in mind were pro play, played maybe a fractionally smaller part than they at one point were going to do. But there's no way you can tell a story uh, about Everton and Liverpool in the 80s and, and, and not touch on what was going on for the, for the people. And, and Derek Hatton was a big part of that. Yeah, definitely. And as I say, you do deserve huge credit for the way you encapsulated it. I thought that, that line was brilliant. It, it's, I think it's an interview at, at the time with a supporter saying, you know, if you're a single lad from Liverpool and, and Everton get a trip down to Wembley, you know, there's not much else going on. So, you know, I'll make Goodison in Wembley, Goodison South, as it were. Yeah, when, when a bloke's got nothing, football's got to do this. Yeah, so, yeah, and it, and it did. And, that, and you know, and uh, Two Tribes very well told that story of how, you know, football really saved the city, you know, because it gave, it gave hope to a city that really didn't have anything else. So, um, yeah, I... I um, I, I was keen to get it in there without going going crazy on it, I think. Mm, definitely. Now, to the interviews with the players themselves, I mean, I'm, I'm full of gratitude to you for that opportunity to, to have the chance to speak to, 
you know, these heroes that I've been told stories from, from my granddad to my dad to my uncle who told me all about, you know, just, just how fantastic that team was and how they were as individual players. Like, I, I remember being, like, fairly confident, obviously. I, 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 you know, from growing up, I know a lot. I've seen a lot. I've researched a lot. But then I remember walking through the doors at that lounge in Goodison and seeing Andy Gray and being like, oh, my God, that's Andy Gray. <laughs> like, honestly... But how, you had how, the best the best talkers, the best three talkers. Well, three of the best talkers were in that room, weren't they? So yeah. Graham Sharp was there, Peter Reid, and Andy Gray. So mm. you know, you're 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 gonna you're gonna do okay if you've got those in the room. Yeah, that I love speaking to them, and I, I was gonna gonna ask you. You've got every right to be proud of every interview that you did because they were all fantastic interviews. But do any of them stand out amongst others? <sighs> yeah, I'm I'm sort of loath to to uh, to. I will anyway. I, I, they, they were all good. They they were all good. I knew Andy would be brilliant. He gave me, I don't know, five, six. He was going back, I think, to Doha the following day. And he had other things booked. And he just kept cancelling them, and, and, which was amazing. So I had five or six hours with Andy. It was, he, he was fantastic. But I sort of knew he would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and Peter Reid is just, he's just a naturally funny bloke. So when you, you sit down with him, I had high expectations of that. Without knowing Peter that well, um, you just, you come away from it and, and you just think that's brilliant. There's, you know, line after line after line from, from Peter Reid. Um, so I knew they would be good and they were good. Um, uh, Kevin Ratcliffe was, was excellent. I really, uh, I really appreciated his time. We, we had maybe, I maybe had an hour with, with Kevin. We did Kevin Ratcliffe, Kevin Sheedy the same day. Um, and, um, and Kevin Ratcliffe was very funny, um, very honest, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, to come out with the stuff about, you know, um, Howard didn't, he didn't think Howard fancied him to start with, um, et cetera. They're all, they're all good interviews, but probably, um, and I say this, you know, Derek gave me, um, so much time and we went up into his loft, etc. cetera. Um, they were all really, really good, but probably the guy that I didn't really know, um that well and and i now consider him to be a a friend is graham sharp um because graham gave an enormous amount of time did then have since um and uh, i said i said to him that you know he was quite early i think that we'd maybe interviewed three or four players when i did graham sharp and i thought if everything collapsed now after doing graham if everything collapsed and i didn't manage to get another interview i had a film after Mm. graham because he did so well in in sort of doing that, that, that chunk of pre-Howard, Howard coming in and him, him again thinking, you know, maybe he doesn't fancy me here. He told me a great story about, you know, uh, building up to the 84 Cup final when he wasn't really sure of his place, you know, and looked at the Cup final programme, the one that was printed early, and it, he was down as a sub, I think. Um, and um, Graham, funny stories. I didn't know that, you know, he had funny stories. He laughed at himself, the tea towel. Um, all sorts of stories that, that Graham told me. And, and that was the interview. Not that it surprised me, but just because I thought, that's great. I've got a film. I've, I've really got a film. I'd, I'd interviewed Andy by that stage. Um, and we'd done Colin Harvey. And so I knew there was some emotion um, around what the end of the film would be. Mm. But, um, uh, but to get Graham, to, to get the amount of time I did with him, and um yeah that was a that was a really that was a really good day and you know that was i think i was up there i think that was the monday and tuesday wednesday thursday friday of that week we shot um nearly all of the rest of the interviews and um it, they were all there was there wasn't anybody that i'll tell you the only thing i came away disappointed and it wasn't uh, paul's fault it was my fault is that i i had got a picture i'd printed a picture of paul bracewell's 1986 85, 86 haircut, which is like an army haircut, short, lots of gel, short, immaculate. I mean, just, and, and his wife was a hairdresser. <laughs> and because uh, Kev Richardson, we'd arranged for Kevin Richardson to come and um, meet us at Paul's house because they don't live too far apart. So Kev was driving down and, and rings um, uh, uh, Paul Bracewell halfway through the interview. So we stop and we do the meet and greet and stuff. And it just, it threw me off and I missed a page which was all about um, Paul's haircut and his hairdressing and being a bit of a fashion icon and stuff. And we managed, we made it work in the film because, you know, Trevor was part of that and, um, and, and I talked to other players about that, but I never 
talk to Paul about the haircut and his missus being a hairdresser and being, you know, loads of Everton fans copied Paul Bracewell's haircut. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, and, and I should mention that because it was, it was funny, you know, and, and it would have been a nice line. And that was, he was the one player because I'd printed up, I'd got an Eniga um, with me and I hadn't done that bit. And that was the one time where I came away and thought, you know, because he's in Durham, you know, so it wasn't like I could pop up. And um, it, was, it was one of those where I, I, right until the end of the film, I was still playing with the idea of saying, Paul, can I come and do you again? But really, just to get a, a line about the haircut and show him the picture, you know, and I maybe lose some of the other things that he gave us. So, um, yeah, but but they were they were all. I didn't have. There were no disappointing interviews. Um, everybody excelled um, with with what they they gave me. And, and I, I mentioned off head, and I, that you know, Kevin Sheedy was my favourite player. And having done the interview with him, and um, and, and thinking about all the other strong quotes that I got from loads of people. I didn't want my favorite player not to have uh, an, a moment to himself in the film. So I rang him after that and said, I want to recreate the Ipswich free kick. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was brilliant. And we've got, you know, Karina um, Duffy at Everton in the community who made things happen for me at Everton. She did a wonderful job there. Um, I spoke to Karina and said, can we get on the pitch? I know it's late. And she organized that. So was able to get Kevin on the pitch. And even though he, damaged his groin warming up um he still was able to um do what we needed him to do which was to put one in the top corner one in the bottom corner um and um yeah so even, even kevin who 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 probably with his interview alongside those like reedy and sharpie and andy gray i might have lost some of it because mm. i was able to do that 85 free kick then then i thought oh excellent box ticked you know I, I've, I've i've got my favorite player in properly <laughs> yeah brilliant i was gonna say like you did a really good job at sort of encapsulating what made individual players so great. Like you give a, each individual player or standout player a few minutes to themselves, if you know what I mean, where they'd autograph mm. their, um, their photograph and you didn't stray too far from the narrative. I thought that was really, really smart. And as you say... Uh, you I, I'd always, in my head, I'd always got, you know, you know the, I don't know if you've ever seen The Magnificent Seven. <laughs> it's such a different era, Max, but... If you watch uh, The Magnificent Seven and The Dirty Dozen, it's basically films where somebody goes about getting their team together. Mm. Uh, and I, and I, thought, I thought I would like to, where possible, introduce everybody in a, with, a, with a style, you know. So, you know, Peter Reed, that was, that was um, uh, the shot of him walking in. I knew he was going to be there that night. He knew we were coming to do that. But to have that, the opportunity to film him walking in with the sort of swagger and the music yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was, was perfect for, for Peter. And, um, and uh, where possible, I wanted to introduce them and let them have a, a, a moment or two before rejoining the film. Yeah, I, I'd, lo I'd love to have the chance to speak to the likes of Reedy and Andy Gray sort of over, over a podcast in a sort of prolonged fashion, because you say, like, Peter Reid, I don't think there's been a cooler man to kick a football, to be honest. He's seen he's fantastic, isn't he? He's isn't he? Yeah, do yeah. you know, the, the problem with Peter, uh, it's not a problem. Well, it is a problem for, for me doing it, is that if you go and see him, you know, when he does any of the players' nights, etc., or an after dinner, he'll tell a million stories. But they will be littered with expletives. And that's just his natural way. And it works, you know, those evenings... You know, people are going to roar with laughter, and they did, and they do everywhere he goes because he tells the stories brilliantly. He's a wonderful raconteur. Um, so he told a lot of stories to me that day, but they lose something if he's having to stop himself to think, I better not swear. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there are a couple of stories that he told me that I still couldn't put in the film, but particularly that night when we had him and Graham and Andy and John Bailey all on the stage together, you know, we had a mic on Reedy. No good, no good. He just in that environment, he's he, he's going to tell the story the way he knows best, and, and quite rightly. But it, it just meant that I couldn't dip into any of those stories. But he is he is as funny a guy as you will ever meet. A funny a guy that's trying to be funny, if you like. We're telling funny stories. Whereas what John Bales, John Bailey, the players will say he doesn't always know that he's being funny, but has a lovely way about him. But you know, Peter is. Just yeah, he's he's almost unique. He's very very funny, and um, it was a, it was a joy to to have the time that we did with him. And 
any of the times that I've, you know, like I've asked him to do um, a Twitter Q and A uh, and come on, you know, I just, it's, it's just great fun mm -hmm. because he gets, he gets, he has the scouse humor. He just gets it. I'm, I'm looking at his Twitter feed, you know, even today, you know, he's put somebody away with a very funny comment, you know, um, and that's just him, you know, he's mm. just a very funny guy, very funny guy. Yeah. I'm going to say with him, with John Bailey, that little bit with him and, and Pat Van Den I was absolutely brilliant. Like, he seem like yeah. a naturally funny guy. So John, John Bailey and Pat were supposed to turn up together. When we did Pat, um, I had, again, that was one of the things. I wanted to do that bit together. I wanted to have sort of Pat interrupt John's interview. That was one of those things that you got planned. So the day that Pat and John were supposed to meet up, John, didn't, John went to the wrong venue. And he doesn't carry a mobile phone, so I couldn't couldn't get a hold of him. So he's wandering around um, Goodison Park, and and you know I run up there later, and I'm like, "Have you seen John Bailey?" "Yeah, yeah, he was here earlier," and I can't get a hold of him. So um, so we had to do Pat on his own, and then bless him, Pat was good enough that when we finally got John Bailey, Pat said, "Yeah, now I'll come down." And um, despite the fact that when we interviewed Pat to start with, I think he was reluctant you know, um, and had to be sort of coerced into doing it. But I thought he was excellent, Pat. I loved, loved, loved him doing it and, and throwing himself into it in the way he did because he didn't, you know, he didn't hold back. He didn't give mm. me sort of one word answers or anything, which he might have done. We've met him before and so it was, it was okay. And I, and I felt like he trusted me that we would, you know, and Dave Feely was there who he knew and I felt like he, he trusted us that we wouldn't stitch him up or anything. And, and I think he was wary of that. But then he came down for when John was doing his stuff at Goodison. And so Pat turned up and bought into it. And, you know, yeah, that was, uh, I loved it. That was another really, really good day. That was the same day we filmed um, Kevin Cheedy's free kick. So there are so many memories that I'll take away from the filming, that, from the experience that we had. And that was one wonderful day. Um, and there were loads of them. Um, and um yeah I, I just feel now i'm talking to you now and i'm thinking about the, the fun that we had and here we are a year and a bit on and, and we're just stuck in and thank goodness i was able to do it last year and, and have that time with them because it was just yeah i mean i'll never do anything where i have as much fun as that never ever ever brilliant um that, yeah i was gonna say like you couldn't have picked a better time and especially with obviously following the pandemic and the, the sort of forced absence of football which I'm sure is like the first time in most people's lifetime that they've, they've ever experienced that other than those that have lived through a war like um, I mean ob obviously no one wants to miss out on the football and everyone's missing it sorely but I'm sure like it, it, have you could have seen like the official Everton channel have been embracing the film uh, and the film seems to be going strong as ever well the, the, you know, the important thing is that the um uh the, the message has sort of changed so everton have got on board because basically we are now giving the proceeds uh from the film to everton in the community's people's place project the mental mental mm -hmm. health facility so uh, all the money raised from the the film is is going to that and and you know and everton have jumped on and have been and have been brilliant you know and i think there's lots more content to come but you know carlo was involved last week wasn't he talking about the film and um and i think maybe there's a bit more uh carlo to come and um and you know andre gomez put out the tweet that he was he was watching it um and wayne rooney and and these are all players that um that the club have helped to 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 get hold of um and hopefully we'll keep going and we'll because there's a big target there isn't it to, to be able to build the people's place is a lot of money mm. um and um the 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 two investors uh in the film and what Phil Brown, who is the other half, so my, my wife uh, and I put up the money because at one point it didn't look like the film was going to get made. So we had a decision either, you know, put it up or don't make it. So we, we, we did. Um, and Phil, who was the other half of the, uh, of the investment, um, he is, uh, he basically is underwriting the production costs. So um, for every pound that is that, that he gets uh, from um from the film proceeds he, he's then matching that um so so in that way we can say 100 percent of the proceeds going to people's place which is which is a brilliant gesture by phil um and um yeah so the club are now, have now they were they were supporting us anyway but now it's different you know because there's an objective here and, and hopefully we can um keep going and and the, you know people keep downloading it and 
buying the DVD because the DVD's got the extras and, and obviously that's the only place you can see all the extras. Um, uh, and, and see if we can't get that, um, that uh, mental health facility built. Yeah, it's great that the, the initiatives have been married almost and you know mm. It, mm. it is very it feels very Everton like to have very Everton isn't it you know I, I totally get what you mean by that it, it feels it, no club is closer to its community to its fans to its, the heartbeat I don't feel and it may, maybe that changes when we go to, to Bramley Moore Dock and you know uh, and, and the more investment that comes in maybe we lose a little bit of that but but right now Goodison Park the people that are involved at, at this club top of the club um, you know, even someone like Richarlison, you know, who shouldn't really have any reason to get, get it. And get it. <laughs> maybe he's not here in three years' time or whatever, but he feels Gomez, Richarlison, they feel like they get it, some of mm. these guys. Um, and, and it is a really special club. And, you know, if I could go back 45 years and be in the playground with all the people that were telling me that, yeah, I should support Liverpool or Forest or whatever, I wouldn't change anything because I just think it's an incredibly special club. And, you know, it, it's a, a huge thrill. I don't really think of it now. Maybe in ten years' time, um, that I will. That that the film is a is a part of the history of the club, or will be. You know, mm. and that's, you know that'll mean an awful lot to me. Um, that people like it, and and that now finally it's represented on film. That great team is represented on film. If there was a, a sort of mission statement before we started that would be it that people get to 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 see that team and, and learn a little bit more about about that team the club the people um it's a very special club i love it yeah i love it yeah and i've, I've seen this bandied about on twitter a few times but honestly like as you were saying may change as, as investment you know continues but if ever that feeling is starting to escape from the club or, or the players or what have you, I've seen the suggestions, you know, sit them down and get them to watch this film. So 100% would agree it will go down as part of the history of the club. Um, I was going to ask you who your favourite player was. You made that clear. It's Kevin Sheedy. Have you in got, that era, he was my favourite player. Bob Latchford, is, Bob Latchford is the only Everton sort of hero I've got, but Sheedy, yeah, that's okay. brilliant. I was going to say, have you got a particular moment from that era that means most to you? The, the the 84 foot well that that whole yeah. film yeah probably Heath's winner against Southampton mm -hmm. because because um again as a kid um my only relationship with Everton was was match of the day papers um <laughs> my my parents friends CFAX five to ten on a weekday five to ten you used to get on BBC Radio 2 you'd get a, a sports bulletin that was the only way you could find out the football scores so in that era the FA Cup final was everything you know they come on air at 11 o'clock um the night before it was about the fa cup finals so as a school kid going going to school in those days the to have the fa cup final focus on your team was was amazing um and it was such a special day that everybody watched the fa cup final in those days even if you were a neutral you still watched it you still cared greatly you still watched all of the build-up and everything that went with it because it wasn't so much football on tv those days so um so that was the moment, you know, having had the heartbreak. And I remember 77 being, because I wasn't allowed to watch, I wasn't allowed to stay up. Uh, so in 77, I was seven when um, we lost in the cup semi-final to Liverpool 3-2. So um, I watched Match of the Day, but only because I was allowed to, to get up, having had three or four hours of sleep between sort of three and seven or something like that. Or no, it wouldn't have been three, but... A little bit later in the day, I had to go to bed to get up to watch Match of the Day. So I remember watching Match of the Day and feeling the disappointment when that goal was ruled out and always having, you know, what are we now? So um, 43 years on, Clive Thomas's name doesn't mean disallowed goal for Brazil against Sweden. It means disallowed goal for, for Everton uh, against um, Liverpool that day. And, you know, his name and, um, and Brian Hamilton's name, uh, you know, these things matter because it denied the cup final opportunity, the, the day of, of coverage. And then, you know, in, in 80, went through it again when Frank Lampard's um, dad, his Frank Lamp Lampard senior's header, sort of bounces at an odd angle and goes in and West Ham beat us. You know, I think they were second to be, I think they were a league below us at the time. And, you know, Latchford had just scored an incredible equaliser. I'm listening to it on the radio. We weren't live. Listening to it on the radio and the noise when, when Latchford scored. And then crying my eyes out when Lampard scored so close to the end and again being denied that opportunity to see my team 
uh, on have that day, that FA Cup final day. And, mm. you know, to, to have the Milk Cup final, there's no real build-up to the Milk Cup final. I remember it being live. I think it was a Sunday, wasn't it? But um, I, I remember it being live and, and watching it, etc. But it wasn't the event, you know, brilliant to be in the Milk Cup final. And it celebrated like crazy when we got there. But but um, but living a sort of te- living Everton through the TV to get to the FA Cup final was, you know, it was everything to have that day. And then when Heath scored and knowing that it was so close to the end and just the noise coming out through the radio, when the radio distorts, when the noise is you know, too great and just the noise and knowing that, you know, you're picking out a few words from the commentator that Heath had scored and realising that what that meant, you know, uh, and my first reaction, because Everton meant heartbreak at that time, mm. was that, well, at least we won't lose now. You know, we're, we're guaranteed another go at this. Um, and, and then, you know, it's over and you're in an FA Cup final. And from that moment onwards, whatever it was, mid-April, April 14, whatever, to, until May the 19th, you know, I'm going to school every day thinking about the FA Cup final and what it's going to mean and being on telly and ordering the, the Cup final programme as we did, got the Cup final. You could order it in those days. So we got the Cup final programme through the, through the post. And, um, and I remember I used to get a comic called Tiger, Tiger and Scorcher, and they had a big build up to, to that and match magazine and, and stuff like that you know it was all dedicated and that meant that from the moment that Heath had, had scored and we'd won that game the whole of my life could be dedicated I was I wasn't O levels that year it was the year before O levels I think for me so it, it could be a whole of my life could be dedicated to waiting and going through an FA Cup day and mm. living it and uh, and also feeling that, that Everton were maybe back because they weren't going to be playing Liverpool in that final. They were going to be playing Watford. And with due respect uh, to them, I just thought we were going to win. I just felt we, we were starting to go that way instead of doing that or that. Um, I just felt that there was something happening. And that day, cameras on in the hotel, cameras on the coaches. I lived that and loved it. And then to win the game. So Adrian Heath's goal and what it meant, the excitement that it that gave me was unmatched. And even though the joy of winning the league the following season and all the other things, nothing that that first time that Everton were on grandstand and, and world of sport for the whole day, you know, furiously flicking over. I, I think actually in those days I had to get up to push the telly over, you know, to so change it from, yeah, I'm sure of it, didn't have a remote, um, to change the channel from BBC One to ITV, you had to physically get off your backside and do it out the TV. But just doing it all the time, just to make sure I didn't miss anything and, you know, get the goal when, when Sharp scored, get the goal and a replay, rush over to ITV. Are they still talking about the goal? Watch both of them, you know, flick again at half time. I'm doing this with my fingers, you know. Yeah. So flick, flick um, from one channel to the other. Just didn't want to miss anything. Watch match of the day in the evening. Ugh. It was it, that, that, that month between the semi final and the final was probably the, the happiest. I don't remember anything I was doing at school at that particular point, but. But I, but I know that that was just, I had a little flat cap, had those, you know, remember the blue and white? Blue and white ones, yeah, yeah. And I had an Everton coat. We must have, I guess that my mum must have ordered it from Everton, I don't know where you would get it from, but I had an, an Everton, an outdoor coat, you know, like in my jacket was, was an Everton one. And, and I just went to school with such pride every day for, well, for, you know, for two years, pretty much from that point onwards. It was, um, yeah, so Heath's goal at Highbury that day. And I know it's special for, all of those guys that were in the ground and ran onto the pitch and all the rest of it. But, but for me in my little home in, in, in the kitchen at, at Cornwall and, and just running off into the garden and uh, it was, yeah, that's my favorite Everton memory and nothing will ever touch it. Excellent. And I know you, quite a few of like the ex players talking to them, they really speak highly of, of that FA Cup and the sort of the spectacle that it was. And, I'd even say going on to 2009, I think I was just still in primary school. I remember, you know, when we beat Manchester United and when we were playing Chelsea in the final, albeit heartbreak by um, Frank Lampard Jr. and, and Didier Drogba. But yeah, mm. it, it meant a lot. And God, I just, I want to see us win something. Do you, do you know though, uh, I mean, I, uh, I was working uh, in 95, I was working for uh, Sky and, um, and you know you're supposed to be i was working with a nick Collins. i see the everton coach coming and i thought i can't i can't not do this <laughs> so i said do you mind do you mind if i run off and uh and he said yeah where are you going i said oh the everton coach is coming 
And he said, are you coming back? And I said, yeah, of course I'm coming back. But anyway, so I, I sprinted off. The Everton coach came in and, and just to a man, they were all shouting, Duncan, Duncan Ferguson. Mm-hmm. Duncan. So I remember shouting that at the coach and then running back to, um, you know, and that, it just took my mind back to 84 and the scenes of the coach coming in in 84. And I just don't think you'll ever match that. No club will go through that. Jimmy Martin, who was the, who was the kit man now mm-hmm. and the bus driver then, says that no bus driver will experience what he did that, that day. Just that, 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 that desperation, and that, but, but with a sort of thank you as well. It was like, we, we've waited so long and now we're, we're back and you're giving us something to be proud of. And the fans, and I don't think the fans are any different. When I go into the Winslow after a game or, or something, or, or I, you know, you've seen me when you guys are recording your bits and bobs at the end of the games, and, 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 and you still feel it and the people coming out, if Everton won a trophy again, it would be absolutely mental. Mm. It'd be mental. And, 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 and I don't care what any other club says, Everton supporters are, are, are different. And you can't, you can't give what they give. If, if you're winning, maybe if you're winning stuff all the time, you, 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 do, you do sort of become a bit nonchalant about it. But Everton supporters are different. They feel it in a different way. The club is different. If they win, if, if we win anything uh, again in the next uh, it would just be especially if we win it while we're still at goodison you know mm-hmm. and so they could have the parade around just to be able to do that would be uh, and the old ground deserves it doesn't it deserves one more you know don't more you think? Parade. So, yeah i just it's an amazing amazing club and we've had so many you know not great moments um but i don't care about any other club I, honestly I don't care. You win everything you want to. If Everton, I'd, I want Everton to get back to the top because your standards are your standards and mine were formed in the 80s. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I don't care about the rest. Just, just let, let Everton have something now. If we can get something, it'd be, it'd be utterly amazing. Oh, God, it'd be amazing. I know. Neil Satter's Nissy Ofterman, right? I mean, exactly that. Exactly that. I, I long for that day when we, when we finally get a bit of bit of silverware, honestly, I'd, I'd be up there. So I'd go miss him for a few days, <laughs> I've got to say, honestly. Rob, it, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and you're more than welcome to, to come on the podcast whenever you want to talk about films, football, media, whatever. <laughs> Loved it. Loved it, Max. Thanks, mate. Brilliant. Thanks for your time.